Okay guys, so today we're gonna to talk about chapter four, which is called A Tour of the Cell. So this is exactly what it sounds like. We're gonna be looking at all of the components of the organelles that make up different types of cells, what they do, things like that. So fundamental units of life, what is that? It's a cell, right? So these things here are basically part of the cell theory that scientists got together and said like, this is what identifies a cell as a cell. So all organisms are made of cells. So in order to be living, you have to be made of the basic fundamental unit of life called a cell. Um, the cell is the simplest collection of matter that can be alive. So again, the smallest thing that is capable of carrying out all of life's functions, which we talked about previously. All cells are related by their descent from earlier cells, which means that cells come from other cells. The theory of spontaneous generation was disproved a long time ago. And now we know that cells are formed from other cells like through mitosis and things like that. Okay, we also have budding and other types of asexual cellular re reproduction as well. And cells can differ substantially from one to another, but they all share common features. And we're gonna talk about some of the common features that are that's just universal among all cells. So here's a little picture for you. Um, it kind of shows you the different sizes. Uh, the first part of this chapter actually talks about various types of microscopes and the different things that you can see in each of these respective types of microscopes. I've chosen to eliminate that because I'm not really focusing on any of that, but this is kind of interesting just to see the different relative sizes of different parts of our um, cells and also different cells in general. Um, my dogs are in the background as well. I apologize for that. So we're gonna start off talking about eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells have internal membranes that compartmentalize their functions. So if you were in my freshman biology class, I explained a eukaryotic cell as like a refrigerator. You don't have your leftover spaghetti just sitting on a shelf. You'd have it in a Tupperware container and you have your milk in a container, not poured out on the shelf. So you have this giant box of all these little containers. Why? Because you're trying to keep everything separate from one another. You don't want your hot sauce mixing with your milk that's disgusting. So eukaryotic cells are organized in very much a similar fashion. So they have little membranes around each of their organelles to keep everything separate. Okay, so compartmentalize their functions. It's physically separated, but also their functions are therefore separated. So the basic structural and functional unit of every organism is one of two types of cells. We have our prokaryotic cells and we have our eukaryotic cells. So as I just said, our eukaryotic cells are gonna be the ones that are highly organized. Our prokaryotic cells are not. They're pretty empty. They have just a few organelles. They're very, very small, very, very simple. So organisms of the domains bacteria and RK are prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are bacteria cells. So RK bacteria and U bacteria are both types of prokaryotic cells. Our protists, our fungi, animals, plants, these are all eukaryotic cells. So these are a little bit more complex beings. So the comparison of the two here, we have prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Those are the only two types of cells. There are no other types of cells. If it is alive, it has to be classified as one of those two things. Basic features of what cells? All cells. If it's a prokaryotic cell, if it's a eukaryotic cell, it's alive, it's a cell, it has these four things has a plasma membrane. How else can we say that? Phospholipid bilayer. How else can we say that? A cell membrane, right? These are just the encasing around the outside of our cells. So think about a water balloon. It is the balloon to the water balloon. It keeps the cell stuff in and the outside stuff out. Okay. It also has a semi-fluid substance called cytosol. Okay. Cytosol is like that jelly stuff that kind of holds everything in place. It's like the quote, empty space in a cell. It's not exactly empty space, but it's like a clear jelly around all of our organelles. We also have chromosomes or you know DNA present in every single cell. If it's alive, it has to have DNA. You also have ribosomes. Ribosomes are really important because what do they do? They make proteins. We know that proteins are our catalysts. They also help to make a lot of structures in our bodies and in cells in general, we need them. So these are the four things that every single thing that is alive and made of cells, because cells are the basic unit of life, have in common these four things. Extremely important that you know that. Okay, prokaryotic cells. Sorry for the little line, don't know what that is. Prokaryotic cells are characterized by having no nucleus, DNA in an unbound region called the nucleoid region, no membrane-bound organelles, and cytoplasm bound by a plasma membrane. Because why? A plasma membrane is in what kind of cell? every single cell, right? So if you were in my freshman biology class, you heard me describe prokaryotic cells as P, B, no, no. What does that mean? Prokaryotic, bacteria, no nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles. 
that basically sums up the most important things you need to know about prokaryotic cells. We were talking about bacterial cells. They're extremely small. There was no nucleus. The DNA is floating around in a region called the nucleoid region. It's roughly in the center of the cell. There are no membrane-bound organelles. This means that there are not little containers around all of your leftovers. Okay, that's in a eukaryotic cell. A prokaryotic cell really only has like the nucleoid region that has DNA floating around and also cytoplasm and ribosomes. And that's about it. There's not much more to them. You would be difficult. Okay, so here's some pictures. So this is a picture of a bacterial cell. Okay, so you'll see the nucleoid region in the middle kind of has like the free floating DNA. They're rod shaped typically. You also have round ones and some spirochetes that are slightly spiral shaped. They're kind of cool. They're all extremely small. You'll see the uh, 0.5 micrometers there, extremely small. These are all of the components that you'll see here. The fimbrae are just like little like kind of like cilia in our cells. The nucleoid region are ribosomes, the plasma membrane, which again, plasma mem membrane and ribosomes are in every single type of cell. Cell walls are also present in a lot of bacteria, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, they also have a capsule for protection um, and then flagella sometimes to help them move. Okay, so eukaryotic cells are characterized by having the following. DNA in a nucleus. Great. It's bound by a membrane-bound organelle, the nuclear envelope. Okay, it has membrane-bound organelles, like we just said. Our eukaryotic cells are like our refrigerators. We put our leftovers in what? Containers. Great. That's a membrane, separating it from the one next to it. Eukaryotic cells are exactly the same. Um, and also cytoplasm in the region between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Again, this is the quote-unquote empty space of the cell. Okay, so eukaryotic cells are generally much larger, much more complex, much more compartmentalized than our prokaryotic cells, which are extremely small, extremely primitive. Our plasma membranes, it's a selectively permeable barrier that allows oxygen, nutrients, other things like that to come in, and then of course our waste removal and things like that um, to come out of the cell, okay? Plasma membrane, again, is made of phospholipids. It is called a phospholipid bilayer. Very important that you know that, okay? Um, phospholipids are some of the most important lipids because they make up every single cellular membrane of every single thing that has ever been alive. Phospholipid bilayer, cell membrane, plasma membrane, same thing, present in every single cell that has ever been and will ever be. So here's a little bit of an uh, illustration for you, if you will. You have the Outside of the cell surface there, you see a bilayer, which means two layers of phospholipids. They look like a lollipop with two sticks. Remember that the sticks are wiggly because these are unsaturated lipid tails, which means that they have those double-double carbon bonds, right, which allows bending. Why is this important? Because that maintains fluidity, right? Your cells are squishy. A water balloon is squishy. You can pinch your skin and it moves, right? It's because you have these membranes that are fluid, which allow things to come in and come out as a selectively permeable membrane. Okay, you have your hydrophobic, hydrophilic regions. We've been through this before. So our metabolic requirements in our cells set an upper limit on the size of a cell. So basically as a cell increases in size, you have the outside part, the phospholipid bilayer that's getting bigger, it's stretching, it's adding more phospholipids to accommodate the size. But then what else is getting bigger? Not the organelles, but all of the cytoplasm, the area between the nucleus and the cell membrane, right? This is expanding. It's getting bigger. And as the cell gets bigger, it gets unhealthy because it has all this extra space. And when you're trying to get rid of waste products, it's very inefficient to move them in and out. Same thing with when you're bringing in nutrients or oxygen or water or anything else that the cell might need. Trying to get it around all of this huge mass of cytoplasm, cytosol, is very difficult. So it's now very inefficient and it's a very unhealthy cell. That's why we divide our cells. So there's a special ratio, it's called the surface area to volume ratio, that's very important to make sure that cells are healthy. You want the maximum um, ratio to have the healthiest cells. So let's look at that. Here's an example for you. You have these cubes, okay? And in these cubes, you can see here that if you have the total surface area, you have one, 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 okay? You got your six there. Look at the surface area to volume ratios down at the bottom. You got your surface area that's calculated out in yellow, your total volume, which is calculated out in blue, okay? And then we have the surface area to volume ratio. You want the biggest ones. That's gonna be the most healthy cell. 
Okay, we'll actually do this physically so you can see how much time it takes for something to reach the center of a cube like this in a little bit. Um, so just a view of our cells here. Our eukaryotic cells have internal membranes that help to divide and compartmentalize everything. They're called organelles. We've been talking about this, the leftovers in the refrigerator, the little containers. Congratulations. That is what makes our organelles, right? They are membrane bound because we're talking about eukaryotic cells. Okay. The plasma membrane and organelle membranes participate directly in a cell's metabolism. Okay. All things that are coming into and coming out of a cell are part of the cell's metabolism because they're going to help aid in metabolizing things or be a waste product that resulted from metabolism. So here's another picture of what's going on inside of our eukaryotic cells here. We've got all these little different colored things. Ooh, pretty. Okay, great. You need to know what all these things do. They all work together. It's like a whole little body in there. There are some organisms that are only made of one cell that looks exactly like this. I mean, not as color coded and everything, but very much like this. And it is a whole little living guy doing its thing. Okay, you're made of trillions of these. We're just cool like that. Okay. Um, here's a plant cell. How do you know it's a plant cell? Well, look at that cell wall. It's also very rigid in structure, also a large central vacuole and chloroplasts. Here's what it actually looks like. So this is like a scanning um, TEM microscope view here. So you can see that you have these slightly less nice looking cells because they're real. Okay, but you can tell that you have like these little elongated cells. You got the little fuzzy parts at the top, which are probably some sort of um, like villi or something like that. And then you have um, your nucleus, which is very, very obvious here. And then the darker nucleolus that's within the center of that. Right. So even though you can't necessarily see all the little tiny organelles around that, you can tell, hey, what kind of cell is this? This is a eukaryotic cell. Look at that nucleus. That's a nice nucleus. This is a eukaryotic cell because only eukaryotic cells have nuclei. The word literally means true nucleus. OK, um, the eukaryotic cells, uh, genetic instructions are housed in the nucleus. Like I said, that's the definition of a eukaryotic cell and carried out by ribosomes. So the nucleus contains the DNA. Most of it, there's a little bit that's not in the DNA, but you know, most of it is inside of the nucleus, inside of our eukaryotic cells. Remember in a prokaryotic cell, it is inside of the what? The nucleoid region, which is not a nucleus, okay? Um, and then our ribosomes are when you use the information from the DNA to make proteins. That's called protein synthesis. And remember that involves mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, which is also called a ribosome, okay? So our nucleus is the information central. Why? Because that's where the DNA is. It is your genetic blueprint. It's what makes you you. It is the directions to create you. Okay, so the nucleus contains our cell's genes. Okay, it's a very large organelle. It's very easy to find in our eukaryotic cells. All right, the nuclear envelope encloses the nucleus, surrounds it. Okay, which separates it. Again, remember compartmentalization. We are in a little Tupperware container over here called the nucleus. That's where the DNA is held. It separates it from the cytoplasm. So the DNA is not in the cytoplasm. Okay, the nuclear membrane is a double membrane like most of our membranes, phospholipid what? Bilayer. Okay, each membrane consists of a lipid bilayer, specifically a phospholipid bilayer. Um, we have pores in the nucleus that help to allow things you know, to move in and out, such as mRNA moving out to go meet up with a ribosome and create a protein for us, really cool. Um, the shape of the nucleus is maintained by something called the nuclear lamina. Okay, this is kind of like what the envelope is created from, and it's mainly a protein, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a proteinaceous coating that keeps the nucleus stuff inside and the rest of the cell outside. Remember, compartments keeping everything separate. Here's some images for you here. Uh, you got a picture of the nucleus. You got your little dark nucleolus in the center. You have um, some other organelles that are on the outside of that. You can see the pores. You can see that you have the um, nuclear lamina that's composing that wall on the outside, the nuclear envelope. Very neat. Okay, so in the nucleus, the DNA is organized into something called chromosomes. So essentially a chromosome is just DNA that is tightly coiled around proteins. These proteins are called histones. Okay, so when we have DNA and proteins of our chromosomes that are together, they're called chromatin. Chromatin condenses to form our discrete chromosomes as the cell prepares to divide. Remember that in prophase, the chromosomes are packed, prophase packed. 
they're t packed very tightly because this is a highly organized structure, such as this loosey goosey double helix DNA floating around all over the place. Okay, and then of course we have our nucleolus, which is located within the nucleus. It's that little dark spot within the nucleus. That is where ribosomes are essentially synthesized because ribosomes are composed of rRNA, literally stands for ribosomal RNA. This is where all of that is created to then go into the cytoplasm and either be free or bound and create a ribosome. So our ribosomes are protein factories. As I said earlier, this is where we are making proteins. So ribosomes are complexes of rRNA called ribosomal RNA and proteins. They carry out protein synthesis in two different locations. They can be free or they can be bound. If you are a free ribosome, you're floating around in the cytosol. If you are a bound ribosome, you're on the outside of the ER or the endoplasmic reticulum or the nuclear envelope. As we saw a few pictures back, those little spots all over them, they're ribosomes. Ribosomes are kind of cool. They look like Krabby Patties to me. You got the large subunit and the small subunit, like a weird hamburger bun. I call them Krabby Patties. When I draw them out on the board for you, I will refer to them as Krabby Patties because they have two subunits that are separate until they meet up with mRNA at the promoter site and they close the bun around the patty, which is mRNA. Next, we're gonna talk about the endomembrane system. So the endo endomembrane system regulates protein traffic and performs metabolic functions within our cells. So the components are as follows. You have the nuclear envelope, which we just talked about, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, endoplasma membrane, which again, what? Phospholipid bilayer, it all means the same thing, okay? Um, these components are either continuous or they can be uh, vesicles. Vesicles are like pieces of the membrane that have like butted off to create its own like little like bubble in order to usually transport something. So the endoplasmic reticulum or ER is a biosynthetic factory. So it accounts for, um, <clears throat> it accounts for more than half of the total membrane inside of your eukaryotic cell. If you go back and look at the pictures, it's that thing that looks like it loops back and forth, back and forth, back and forth a billion and a half times. Yeah, that's the endoplasmic reticulum. It's quite extensive, right? So the ER membrane is continuous, with the nuclear envelope. It's actually just a continuation of it. So they're composed of similar things. Okay, there's two different distinct regions of the ER or the endoplasmic reticulum. There is a smooth section and a rough section. It's literally talking about the texture. So the smooth ER does not have any bound ribosomes on it. It's just ER. If it is the rough ER, it has ribosomes embedded within its like little membrane. So you'll see that in just a second, that it looks like little studs all over it, all the ribosomes, and you can have protein synthesis taking place there. So you can see in the picture here, the smooth ER does not have any of those little bumps on it. The bumps are called ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes make our proteins. Rough ER, continuous with our uh, nuclear envelope there, right? You see all the little ribosomes. Well, it makes sense that the mRNA exiting the nuclear pores is going to attach right there to our rough ER bound ribosomes, which is really convenient because it's a short distance to make your proteins. Okay, we have then the smooth ER. Okay, so the smooth ER synthesizes lipids. Synthesizes is another word for makes, combines lipids. Um, it metabolizes carbohydrates, which again are sugars. It detoxifies drugs and poisons. So where would you find a lot of these in the body? You'd have cells that have a lot of smooth ER. Where? In your liver. Okay, also stores calcium ions. Functions of our rough ER. The rough e ER has our bound ribosomes. They look bumpy because it's rough, because it has ribosomes. You can also think rough ribosomes. Both start with the same letter. Pretty convenient. Great. Okay. So has rough um, has our our ribosomes, which secrete glycoproteins. Okay, glycoproteins are like carbs and proteins like together. So proteins that are covalently bonded to carbohydrates, because glyco refers to sugar and protein is well, of course, you know, a protein. Um, the rough ER also distributes transport vesicles and proteins. Um, these are typically proteins that are surrounded by a membrane that's going to go to perform a specific function in the cell. And then it's also a membrane factory for the cell. So it can also can, um, create different components of the cell wall in order to then transport them through vesicles to the cell wall in order to repair or grow or do things like that. Next, we have the Golgi apparatus. It is a shipping and receiving center. Sometimes like in elementary school or middle school or wherever you first learned about this, you probably heard that it was kind of like FedEx. 
you put like a zip code on something and it tells you where to send it. Well, that's kind of what happens with the Golgi. So the Golgi apparatus consists of flattened membranous sacs called cisternae or cisterna, depending on how you'd like to pronounce that. I differentiate between the two because why not? So functions of the Golgi apparatus are as follows. It modifies products of the ER. So the ER creates different things that we just talked about here, right? Lipids, metabolizes carbohydrates, so it can help further break things down like that. Um, also parts of the, the cell membrane. It's gonna modify these. And it can also manufacture certain macromolecules. Remember, we talked about our four macromolecules already this year. It can sort and package materials into transport vesicles, which is kind of like where it gets the whole FedEx analogy, because then it's going to send them around the cell to wherever they're supposed to be, based on specific receptors that are on the outside of these transport vesicles. So here's some examples for you here. So on the receiving end, that's like the closest part. It's the part that's closest to the nucleus. It's going to be receiving information from outside. Okay, and then you have the, um, the shipping side or the outgoing side. It's going to be where all those vesicles are actually butting off to then go and do whatever task they are tasked with. Next, we have lysosomes. Lysosomes are cool because they are just little balls of destruction. They are digestive compartments. So think about a lysosome like a stomach within a cell, a microscopic stomach. So the lysosome is a membranous sac of hydrolytic enzymes, hydro water lytic to break, breaking with water. There we go. Hydrolytic enzymes that can digest macromolecules. Remember when we talked about catabolism? Remember when we talked about hydrolysis? This is where all that comes into play. Okay, enzymes are proteins. One of our macromolecules that we talked about speeds up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy, right? Okay, so these hydrolytic enzymes, again, what are they? They're enzymes that are going to use water to break macromolecules apart. Isn't this what we've been talking about? It's a beautiful thing. Okay, so it's essentially a little tiny stomach that takes big things and breaks it apart. How? By using water. Okay, so lysosomal enzymes can hydrolyze or break with water proteins fats polysaccharides and nucleic acids funny that's all the macromolecules it's almost like we've learned this before lysosomal enzymes work best in acidic environments that's inside of the lysosome so it's very important that these are compartmentalized like all the rest of our little you know leftovers in our refrigerator that is our eukaryotic cell because if these were to bust open and break out everywhere you're going to have all these lysosomal enzymes that are going to cause this hydrolysis of like large portions of the cell potentially, unless there was a very basic or alkaline environment that inhibited them from working, who knows. Um, this is really an important thing for our phag phagocytic cells. So some of our cells can engulf other cells through a process called phagocytosis, okay? Um, this is basically cellular eating, it's like the the normal people way of saying that cellular eating one cell will like wrap around and bring in another cell phagocytosing it bringing it inside and then it's going to digest it so a lysosome is going to fuse with that food vacuole that thing that it just ate and then digest it like a stomach right so lysosomes also use enzymes to recycle the cell's own organelles and macromolecules for instance if something is broken or you have a surplus of something um and that, that process is called autophagy Here's some images for you here. Um, if you have a food vacuole coming in, or if this were like an engulfment, like in a phagocytosed uh, vesicle or something, you have a vacuole that's coming in, it's going to merge membranes, our phospholipid bilayer, with our lysosome, and all those little digestive enzymes are gonna break down whatever is inside of that vacuole. It could be food, it could be something that needs to be broken down, it could be a foreign body that you're like, I don't know what this is, but I'm gonna kill it. How? With my lysosome. Okay, so next we have vacuoles, and these are very diverse. They can do a whole lot of different things. They can contain a whole lot of different things. It's basically a large sack. Um, so large vesicles that are derived from the ER and the Golgi apparatus. Okay, we have food vacuoles formed by phagocytosis, which we just talked about. We have contractile vacuoles, which what do you think they do? They contract. What does that mean? You know, essentially get smaller to tense up to, well, I'm going to say become smaller here. Found in a lot of things that live in fresh water. Why? Fresh water is a hydro, um, I'm sorry, it is a uh, hypotonic environment. Hypo, tonic, hypo, hippo, big fat O. The cells are going to swell because water is rushing into those cells. 
But if you have a contractile vacuole, all that excess water is going to be stored in a contractile vacuole, and then it's going to be shot back out of the cell. It's going to be squeezed back out like a big pump. And some cells use this to move, which is pretty cool. Like a little tiny, like, motor on the back of the cell. Okay, you also have central vacuoles, which you've heard about in plants, stores water and other organic compounds. Remember, organic means carbon and hydrogen containing compounds. And we also have other vacuoles that carry out various functions, like enzymatic um, hydrolysis, like lysosomes that are present in some plants and some fungi. Here's a picture of some vacuoles for you. Very, very familiar with our central vacuole found in plant cells. So a review of our endomembrane system, endo internal membrane, you know, membrane talking about like phospholipids and things. The endo endomembrane system is a complex and dynamic player in the cell's compartmentalization or organization. Like I said, eukaryotic cells is like a giant refrigerator. You got all your stuff in different compartments. The membrane is like the outside of the container. It's keeping everything separate so nothing touches. Think about your lysosomes. If something touches your lysosome, it's going to get killed. You got to keep them separate. So you can see here some of our endomembrane systems. You can see that they are all separated by, you know, membranes, but they all interact with each other in order to carry out cellular functions. Next, we're going to talk about mitochondria and chloroplasts, really cool things. Mitochondria and chloroplasts change energy from one form to another. Remember, it's not created or destroyed. It's just like transformed. Okay. So we have our mitochondria that are the site for cellular respiration. Cellular respiration occurs in every single thing that is alive. I'm going to say that again for those of you in the back. Mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, is the site of cellular respiration, which occurs in what? Every single thing that's alive. Everything. Okay, a metabolic process that uses oxygen to create ATP. It can also sometimes not use oxygen in our anaerobic cellular respiration. That's why every single thing uses cellular respiration. Okay, then we have our chloroplasts. These are not in every single living thing, obviously. Chloroplasts are in our plants and algae. Okay, sometimes protists too because protists like to be different. Okay, they're the site of photosynthesis. No matter how much you would like to, you cannot stand outside at lunch and get a meal from the sun. You get your meal from Whataburger or Chick-fil-A down the street. Okay, peroxisomes are cool. We're going to do a whole lab about their reactions. They are oxidative organelles. They can add oxygen to things. They can take away oxygen from things. They break down harmful things. Peroxisomes are present in most eukaryotic cells. And we are going to study exactly what they do in your body and how they help keep you alive. Evolutionary origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts. This is mind-blowing stuff, people. So the endosymbiosis theory says that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts that we have in our current present-day eukaryotic cells were once like kind of like bacteria, that one big cell just ate another one and then they lived one inside the other endosymbiosis living inside of in harmony, right? And then that's what made our modern day cells because prokaryotic cells came way before eukaryotic cells. So essentially, here's our similarities, right? Mitochondria and chloroplasts have similarities with bacteria, such as um, they have a double membrane, which is evidence that it could be a cell on its own. Um, they contain free ribosomes ribosomes, double membrane, this sounds a lot like a bacteria cell so far, and circular DNA. Again, also sounds a lot like a bacteria to me. Okay, and they can grow and reproduce somewhat independ independently of a cell. Um, they will reproduce like if you are an athlete and you use a lot of ATP, cellular energy, you need a lot of powerhouses, also called the mitochondria inside of your muscle cells to do all that work for you, right? You will have a lot more mitochondria in those cells. They can kind of like reproduce on their own, kind of. So endosymbiont or endosymbiosis theory. So basically prokaryotic cells came first. Specifically non-photosynthetic cells were engulfed by eukaryotic cells, essentially. One cell ate another cell and they lived together in harmony and everyone was happy. So they formed a single organism over time. That's, that's, the, that's the theory there because they have all of these characteristics we just talked about here that sound a lot like a bacteria. So it's possible that one cell ate a bacterial cell and then boom, all of a sudden evolution occurs over millions of years. Okay, 
So here's a little picture of that for you. You have a cell that is eating another cell, also called the mitochondrion, which is one single mitochondria, okay? And then that can also happen with chloroplasts and then boom, present day photosynthetic plant cells. Pretty neat. Um, so the mitochondria, like I said, it's the site of what? Cellular respiration, which happens in what? Every single thing that's ever been alive, okay? Mitochondria are in nearly all eukaryotic cells, okay? They have a smooth outer membrane and an inner membrane folded into a cristae, okay? It increases the surface area to allow more room for ATP to be generated because it is the what? It is the powerhouse of the cell, and what does that mean? It makes ATP. Congratulations, that's energy. Okay, so the inner membrane creates two compartments, the intermembrane space, because, you know, there's a space in between the two, okay, and the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, so some metabolic steps to cellular respiration are catalyzed or sped up, you know, by like enzymes and stuff, in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, the cristae create a huge surface area for the enzymes to synthesize ATP, and scientists were very creative in naming this ATP synthase. It's the name of the enzyme that creates ATP. What a miracle. So here's some pictures of our mitochondria or mitochondrion here for you. It has like a double membrane here and you can see that inner cristae is very like lobulated. It's bubbly. It's got some squiggles to it that increases the surface area. That way you can have more metabolic surface. Next we have chloroplast. Chloroplast capture light energy. Chloroplasts contain green pigments called chlorophyll, okay, um, as well as enzymes and other molecules that function during photosynthesis, okay. Chloroplasts are found in the leaves and other green organs of plants and in algae. Algae, of course, don't have leaves, but mostly if we're talking about plants, we're talking about the leaves. That's the, the biggest site of photosynthesis in algae. Sometimes they're, you know, these little microscopic unicellular organisms, they just contain like a couple chloroplasts. So the chloroplast structure includes a thylakoid and a thylakoid membrane. It's a membranous sac, so it's kind of like tiny green pancakes. And when you have a stack of tiny green pancakes, it's called a granum. One of them is called a grana. So multiple granum are stacks of tiny green pancakes, and thylakoids is one green pancake. Okay, the stroma is like the fluid inside of the thylakoids, inside of the grana. Okay, um, the chloroplast... The chloroplast is one of the one of a plant's organelles that's known as a plastid. That's kind of like the class name that's given to them. Okay. Um, so here's kind of what I'm talking about. Tiny green pancakes. Here we go. All right. So if you have one of them, it's one pancake. If you have a stack of pancakes, it's called a gran nut. If you have multiple stacks of, oh, I'm sorry. I just flipped that on you. It's a gran num if it's one stack and it's a gran nut if it's multiple stacks of pancakes. Okay, um, you have little ribosomes there that are happening because those are involved in what? Protein synthesis. Okay, the stroma is the clear fluid around the outside here. Um, and all of this, of course, is within a chloroplast, which is typically found in a plant cell. Peroxisomes, remember we talked about this earlier? Oxidation, they, they contain oxidases. So peroxisomes are specialized metabolic compartments bounded by a single membrane this time. They wanted to be different, a single membrane, not a double membrane. Um, they produce hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, called hydrogen peroxide, and convert it into something harmless called water. This is a reaction that we will be studying very soon in our class. Again, for those of you in the back, peroxisomes produce hydrogen peroxide, also called H2O2, and convert it into something very safe for us called water, also H2O which means they're gonna be releasing something. H2O2 to H2O sounds like we're releasing some oxygen. Okay, so peroxisomes perform reactions with many different functions. Um, basically, they help to detoxify things because hydrogen peroxide is toxic to our cells, whereas water is uh, you know, useful to our cells. Here's a picture of a peroxisome for you. The cytoskeleton is the next thing that we're going to be talking about. This is kind of like your skeleton gives you structure and support and shape. And that's essentially what the cytoskeleton network does inside of our cells. So the cytoskeleton is a network of fibers that organize structures and activities within a cell. 
So the cytoskeleton is a network of fibers extending throughout the cytoplasm. Again, that's like the clear area between the nucleus and the plasma membrane. It organizes the cell structures and activities and anchors a lot of the organelles. They're not just like floating around aimlessly in space. They're kind of like anchored or like attached and how to the cytoskeleton. So here's a picture, these like green little like webby guys. That's kind of what we're talking about here. So like the blue is obviously like the nucleus. Okay. So these green membranes called the cytoskeleton give support and structure to the entire cell. And it allows kind of like a little transportation highway to move things around because it's like a little web that extends through the whole cell. So the roles of the cytoskeleton are for su support and mobility, motility, which is the same thing as mobility. Okay, so the cytoskeleton helps to support the cell and maintain its shape, much like our skeleton helps us for support and, you know, shape. Um, it interacts with motor proteins, which we'll talk about in a minute, and we'll actually watch a couple of videos of that in class um, to help um, promote motility here. Um, so inside the cell, you have vesicles and other organelles that can actually, quote, walk, and it actually looks like a little guy with two tiny little fat legs that walk along the cytoskeleton, and we'll talk about what they were, what they are in a second. Okay, so like I said, a little short guy that has little short fat legs that kind of like walks along these cytoskeletons. This particular one is a microtubule. There are different types of uh, filaments that make up our cytoskeleton, which we'll talk about pretty soon. Okay, but this is an example of a motor protein that is, quote, walking. It literally moves one little leg at a time along the cytoskeleton in order to move this vesicle from point A to point B. This is like our transportation highway. So components of the cytoskeleton. There are three different types of fibers, like I just said. We have microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. So microtubules are the thickest of the three that make up the cytoskeleton. Microfilaments, also called actin filaments, these are important for like muscles especially, are the thinnest components. And then you have intermediate filaments that are fibers with diameter somewhere in the middle. That's why they're called intermediate, because it's in between the thickest and the thinnest. Great. Um, so here's a little bit about each of them. You see up at the top all the names, and then you see like how big they are, and also what they do. So all of them help to maintain the cell shape. Microtubules are important for like motility, um, microfilaments, like I said, with like uh, muscles, it helps our muscles contract and other things like that. Intermediate filaments are going to be used to like anchor things, and the formation of the nuclear lamina, which is like the nuclear envelope that we talked about earlier. It's a membrane on the outside of the nucleus that keeps the nucleus separate from the rest of the cell. Microtubules, remember that these are the fat ones. Um, these are hollow rods. They're hollow. It's really interesting that they're hollow, actually. Um, constructed from globular protein dimers called tubulin. What's a dimer? Di means, hopefully you just said two, and mer means, hopefully you just said piece. So two, a uh, protein that has two pieces is called tubulin. Two, bulin, two, p. Okay, cool. Um, functions of microtubules include... Um, to help to shape and support the cell, guide movement of our organelles, and separate chromosomes during cellular division. That's what those spindle fibers are made of. The spindle, spindle fibers separate the chromosomes during anaphase. That's what microtubules help us do there, right? They're helping the cell divide. Um, we have centrosomes and centrioles. The centrosome is the region and the centriole is the actual little organelle. So in animal cells, notice I said in animal cells. Did I say in plant cells? No, I said in animal cells. That's a big difference between plant and animal cells, which are both eukaryotic cells, but do have differences. This is one of them. So again, in animal cells, microtubules grow out from the centrosome, which is near the nucleus. And the centrosome is a microtubule organizing center where you will see a pair of centrioles, each with nine triplets of microtubules arranged in a ring. This is important because this is how microtubules typically like to be arranged. And you're gonna look at a picture of that in a second because you're gonna say nine triplets. That sounds like it's complicated. It's pretty, it looks like a little star kind of like this. So the centrosome is the region for the, like the region. It's the name for the whole region. The centrioles are these actual little units that look like the stars, which are composed of microtubules. And again, it is nine triplets. This is important. Nine triplets of microtubules. This is how it's arranged. It's important. Okay. Um, we have our cilia and flagella, which are all part of this, uh, cytoskeletal complex we're talking about here. 
So microtubules control the beating of cilia and flagella. So cilia are like the little ones that look like fingers that are like little waving at you. And the flagella are like the big tails that you're like associating with like, oh, that's on the sperm cell. Yeah, you're right. Congratulations. That's a flagellum. Okay. Um, they are microtubule containing extensions or projections from some cells. Not all cells have these, but some of them do. So flagella are limited to one or a few of them per cell. Because if you had a whole lot... You wouldn't be swimming in one direction if they were like all over the place. Your cell like would never move and it'd be fighting against itself, which is kind of stupid. Um, while cilia can occur in large numbers all over the cell's surface. You'll find these a lot in like digestive tracts and things like that to help the little waving fingers move things along, if you know what I mean. Okay, so cilia and flagella also differ in their beating patterns because the cilia don't have a lot of length. They move very fast and kind of in waves and in your intestines. That's part of um, the, the whole thing of peristalsis, which is the involuntary muscle contractions that move your poop out your body. Great. Um, cilia help with that. Flagella are kind of more of like a beating. And it's like um, a lot of them spiral um, in movement. Cilia and flagella are common in structure. Again, we're talking about microtubules. So a core of microtubules sheathed by the plasma membrane. So the basal body that anchors the cell and flagellum. We're gonna talk about this in just a second in the picture. Then we also have a motor protein. What does it do? You know, motors help things, you know, move. So it's called dynein, which drives the bending movements of the cilium or flagellum. So it's a little complicated, but you got your triplet rings that we're used to looking at here for the cross section of the basal body. You can see the cross section of the basal body is that transverse um, cut there through where it's attaching to the cell. And then you can see like a more terminal end. It looks a little bit different. You have your dining proteins that are going to help drive the movement, the beating patterns. How dining or walking moves flagella and cilia. So dining arms alternately grab and move and then release outer microtubules. So it's literally like walking along. Um, the outer doublets, so the little arms, okay, and the... Um, Central microtubules are held together by flexible cross-linking proteins. This sounds like a lot of words that we're going to look at videos in class. So, like, just, just take a breath. It's okay. Okay, and then the movements of the doublet arms cause the cilium or the flagellum to bend. And then this happens repeatedly in order to have it bend back the other way to create, like, a beating motion. Microfilaments are our second type of um, cytoskeletal fiber that we're going to be talking about. They're also called actin filaments. Microfilaments are thin, solid rods, whereas microtubules were like very large, hollow rods. Okay, built from molecules of globular actin subunits. The structural role of microfilaments is to bear tension. So this is important in our muscles where we are flexing. I like to pick things up and put things down. You are contracting. You are having a lot of tension. Okay, resisting pulling forces within the cell. Um, bundles of microfilaments make up the core of microvilli of intestinal cells. These little microvilli were like, they kind of have like the little like waving, like cilia kind of, but a little bit smaller even than that that I was talking about earlier. So this is a microvillus, one single little finger there that would be present on the inside of your intestinal tract. Microfilaments that function in cellular motility interact with motor proteins called myosin. For example, actin and myosin interact to cause muscle contraction, which I just talked about because they are bearing tension. Um, and it also, these two um, interact to cause like amoeboid movement, which is kind of like a pseudopod, like it'll stretch out and then like contract and it'll reach out again and then contract. And it's like, like kind of how a snail moves or like an inchworm kind of situation um, of our white blood cells and also the cytoplasmic streaming in plant cells. Intermediate filaments are our third of our three cytoskeletal fibers. These are the intermediate. They are in between our fat microtubules and our really thin microfilaments. Intermediate filaments are larger than microfilaments but smaller than microtubules, which I just said. They support cell shape and fix organ organelles in place. So like I said, they're kind of anchoring things around the cell to make sure like, hey, ribosome, you need to stay over here. Hey, you need to stay over here. Hey, lysosome, don't go floating off on me. I need you over here. It kind of acts as like an anchor because you can use proteins to attach the organelles to these intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments are more uh, permanent cytoskeletal elements than the other two classes because they act as these anchoring points around the cell. 
Um, extracellular components and connections between cells help to coordinate cellular activities. So cells need to communicate with each other in order to coordinate what's going on within the body if it has you know trillions of cells like our bodies do or even if it's a very simple organism that only contains a couple of cells communication is key and you use a lot of extracellular components to establish communication so most cells synthesize and secrete or release materials that are external to the plasma membrane this means on the outside of the cell as in past the membrane these extracellular materials are involved in many different cellular functions um, most importantly of them of course communication so cell walls of plants. The cell wall is an extracellular structure, it is on the outside, that distinguishes plant cells from animal cells because plant cells have cell walls made of cellulose whereas animal cells only have our cell membranes. Now don't get that wrong, plant cells still have a cell membrane. Please do not ever tell me that a cell does not have a cell membrane because every single cell has a cell membrane. We learned that at the beginning of this. It's been a minute, but it's still a fact. Prokaryotes, fungi, and some protists also have cell walls. Prokaryotes typically have cell walls that are composed of peptidoglycan. It sounds like pet the dog I can, but it's pronounced peptidoglycan. Fungi, says, spelled like chitin, pronounced like chitin. That is the cell wall component of a fungus. Some protists, protists are weird. They have cellulose, they have peptidoglycan in some of them, they have chitin in some of them. They're kind of the gray area of science that nobody really likes, protists. They all have cell walls though. Not every single protist, but these examples I just gave. Um, the cell wall helps to protect the plant cell. It maintains its shape. It also helps to prevent an up, uh, like excess amount of water because if you have too much water in the cell, remember it will break, it will pop open. Okay, so this helps to prevent too much water from entering into the cells and bursting everything and killing the organism. Plant cell walls are made up of cellulose, which remember is just repeating glucose, which is a polysaccharide at this point in a cellulose form, right? Glucose is of course a monomer. Fibers embedded with other polysaccharides and proteins. Look at those macromolecules coming back to haunt some of you. Plant cell walls also have multiple layers. We're gonna look at this in the next picture. You're gonna look at the primary cell wall, which is what you typically think about. The middle um, lamella, which is like between that, and then the secondary cell wall, which is in some cells. Let's just look at it. And then the plasmodesmata are the channels between plant cells. Let's look at it. So you can see in the actual picture, they're like, this is actually how plant cells look. Okay, so you have the three different components that we just talked about there. Um, and then the middle lamella is like the, I'm going to call it like a holiday, like an open space kind of like between this, the plant cells. And the really cool thing here, you can see the plasma desmata down at the bottom. Um, they're like little channels, like little fingers that connect the cytoplasm of all of these different plant cells. And this allows for cellular communication because they can easily move materials back and forth between them, um, which is really interesting. So that's plasmodesmata. Um, the extracellular matrix of animal cells is a little bit different. So we just talked about it in plants. So animal cells lack cell walls, of course, but they do have, of course, a phospholipid bilayer because every cell has a phospholipid bilayer, right? Right. So animal cells lack a cell wall, but are covered by an elaborate extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix is made up of glycoproteins, which we talked about earlier, earlier, glyco, sugar, protein, you know, protein, such as collagen, which is the most abundant protein in your body, um, proteoglycans and um, fibronectin. So all of these are different components that are present on the outside of different cells to help with cellular communication and things like that. Um, we also have extracellular uh, matrix proteins that bind to receptor proteins in the plasma membrane called integrins. Um, these are things that are integrated within the plasma membrane that help to interact between the internal and external um, sides of your cell. So if you look here, you can see the plasma membrane. You can see that you have some embedded proteins here. They look like kind of like weird butterflies, if you will. Those are your integrins. Um, they they can communicate with the interior and exterior surfaces of the cell membrane, so of the cell. Um, we have cell junctions, so neighboring cells in an animal or plant cell often adhere or interact and communicate with each other through physical contact, so direct touch of the cells. There's different types of intracellular junctions that can um, help to establish this communication. Plasmodesmata, which we looked at earlier, and then we also have something called tight junctions, uh, desmosomes, and gap junctions, more common in animals. 
Plasma desmata are channels that um, perforate plant cell walls, like we saw a couple cells, uh, cells, a couple slides back. That's where the cytoplasm was connected. It looks like little fingers through the cytoplasm. It goes straight through the cell wall to connect the um, cells together. Through plasma desmata, water and small solutes, so things that um, you know are not other liquids. They're like small molecules. Sometimes proteins, RNA, things like that can pass from cell to cell very easily. Um, then we also have tight junctions and desmosomes and gap junctions in our animal cells. So again, animal cells, plant cells, differences here, pay attention to the differences. Animal cells have three main types of cell junctions, which I just listed for you, and all of them are common in your epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues line the outer parts of your body. So like you have some inner parts of your body that you think to be inner, but they're also lined by epithelial tissues because they're quote connected to the outside. Um, and here's some pictures of what we're talking about here. So the tight junctions um, prevent fluid from moving across a layer of cells. Um, you can see the uh, plasma membranes that are adjacent to each other. There's like, that's where the, you know, you get like junctions between there as well. You can see the tight junctions. Um, the desmosomes are the areas between cells here. You have gap junctions. Um, we'll look at videos of all of those. So I think that this is just uh, summarizing everything we just talked about. I really tried to cut this down for y'all. It was like 200 slides. I got it down to like 75 or something. Great. So cellular functions arise from cellular order. Also remember that structure dictates the function. That's kind of another fancy way of saying all of that. So the cell has all this stuff going on inside of it, and it's kind of like its own little little person like it's a, its own little organism right all these organelles just like you have organs to help support your growth and development and you know life in general cells have all of these little intracellular parts that help to maintain their lives and homeostasis and all of that as well yay that's the end okay so we made it we did it this is our chapter four lecture please go back through this listen to it again if there's a part that you didn't understand or i talked too fast listen to it a couple of times if you slow me down i sound absolutely ridiculous Please enjoy that as well. Make sure that you have your notes done. Here's another thing. Yes, this follows along with chapter four. Make sure that you have, you know, read the book. Because as some of you are seeing on the exams, because I have assigned the reading and you've not done it, there are some things that have popped up from the reading that I didn't like explicitly point out in class because the reading is assigned. So you're supposed to be doing it. And if you're not, you have all these little tiny, tiny holes that together create a big gap in your learning about all this information. So please, please, please make sure that you go back through, read the chapter. Please, please, please read the chapter. Okay? Thanks for listening. Thanks for bearing with me. Sorry this was long. See you soon.